So we want to start maybe with Sarah. Oh, <laughs> um, let's see, Shailene. Um, I know I spoke to you briefly last night. Um, the script, or at least the early draft of it, was written by the same guys who did Spectacular Now. Um, and obviously, that's a great film, and Miles is in it, which Miles is also in Divergent. Yeah, he um, is. I kind of wanted to go around and say, why isn't Miles in this movie? Because <laughs> he's in a cameo. He actually has a cameo. He walks by in no, the background. He oh, really? No, he doesn't. No, he doesn't. No, he doesn't. <laughs> Everybody would be searching for yeah. like. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, he's not in this film because there wasn't there wasn't a role for him. That's mostly a joke question. Yeah. There aren't that many. There aren't that many. There, the Fallen Stars is such a small movie. Like when it's I was. True, watching, there are not a lot of characters. When I was watching Divergent, I, I just kept being like, so many people in this movie have lines. Yeah. <laughs> you know? like, yeah. How do they like, fit these many? Yeah. There's people. like sixty people with lines. We have like yeah. six people with lines in our yeah. movie. But the difference is there are sixty people with lines in Divergent, and but everyone only had one line. Yeah. Right. 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 There's sixty people, but everyone is lying. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know how Scott and Michael were chosen to write the script? I know a little bit about it. Do you? No. I don't. Yeah. Um, they were chosen because they're the best. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're <laughs> you know, they were... Wick and Isaac, the producers of the movie, were looking for people who were good at, um, good at book-to-movie adaptations, but who also... Uh, I, I, my my main concern with to them, the main concern that I had expressed was not with pr- preservation of the story, but with preservation of the tone, which I thought was going to be really difficult to do, um, and I was worried the tone would get watered down, or, or you know, and so um, they talked to a bunch of people, they sent me a bunch of scripts, um, we had a lot of conversations, and then they finally said, you know, we, we met with Weber and Neustadter, and they had an amazing take, and we think that they are the right people, even though they aren't, they, you know, initially they'd sort of wanted a writer, director type of person, yeah. and they said, you know, we, we really believe that they're right, and um, and I was, and you know, they made, they wrote 500 Days of Summer, and did you like that? And I was like, yeah, I like that. And they were like, well, read this script for this this movie, The Spectacular Now. And I read it, and I was like, yes, those guys. So yeah. good. Because I'd read the book, The Spectacular Now. Very and, different. Um, it's very, very different. And but they 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 captured something that was really essential, the the, the, the tonally, yeah. um, which is much more interesting to me than capturing story. And um, yeah, so I just, I, and then they wrote. Much harder. Much, much harder. Yeah. And then the first draft of the um, of the script was, was like finished. It was like perfect. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So. Was there actually, uh, did you have a draft of this Imperial Affliction? Did you, did you have no, I mean, the only parts of an Imperial Affliction I ever wrote are the parts that appear in the book and then um, the parts that appear in the movie. Um, in the movie, Hazel is reading an Imperial Affliction, so I wrote. Three pages, right? Three or four pages. I have a copy of the fake Imperial Inflation book. Me too, me too. And I have, it's just three pages that repeats itself. Yeah, just 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 four pages pages that repeats for 700 pages. Yeah. Um, It's really meta. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Yeah, it's a beautiful novel. Uh, It's a little repetitive toward the end, but um, it's a great book. The whole thing is a little repetitive. (laughs) (laughs) The first four pages are awesome. The first four pages are wonderful. Yeah. 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 It's just kind of does feel like it's trotting some of the same yeah. territory. Um, but by the end, you really know what's going on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, you got it down pat. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I, I mean, I wanted an Imperial Affliction to be an imaginary book because I think there's a perfection to books that don't exist that, that can't can't happen for, for books that do exist. Um, and I really wanted, I liked that idea. Um, I liked it thematically, but then I also, also wanted, um, I, I also just didn't feel like I could, could write it, you know. How do you tap into the themes of like teenagers talking to each other? I mean, you seem to have gotten that down really well. Yeah, I don't. I mean, I don't know anything about how they talk to each other. All of my friends are in their late thirties, and we have kids, and all we ever talk about is like what preschool our kids are going to go to. Um, <laughs> but I read a lot is of. Is that your next book? Yeah, it's going to be like uh, which Indianapolis preschool makes the most sense for my my two year old. It's going to be so the stakes are going to be so high. Um, I, I like I, I I read a lot of comments, YouTube comments, Twitter uh, posts, Tumblr posts that are written by teenagers. Obviously, just in the course of my work, but the main thing for me is that. Um, 
the emotional truths are there, and that's all that really matters. Um, I, I don't think kids care if you captured slang properly. I think generally, actually, when you try to capture slang properly, it's an epic, epic failure. Um, so yeah, I just try to write um, with emotional authenticity and, and trust that they'll forgive me whatever mistakes I make. I don't think you try. You do. Oh, thanks, buddy. <laughs> I don't know why I've been calling you buddy lately. Uh, yeah. Because I, I always call everybody buddy. Oh, nice. Okay. Maybe that's why. Because I'm uh, like, hey, buddy. All right. Good, uh -huh. good. In the book, he used one of uh, my favorite artist's paintings, the Sin of Pipe. Yeah. Uh, what made you want to use that involving with Shailene's character? What a hip question. That is a cool question. Yeah. So, um, that's a great question. I mean, it's got kind of a boring <laughs> answer, but I'll give it to you anyway. Um, <laughs> I'm really interested in art. My wife is a curator of contemporary art, so I just get a lot of it by osmosis. And um, in an imperial affliction, one of the very few things that we do know about it is that it's very concerned with identity and um, authenticity and the relationship between like the perceived self and the real self, which I think is interesting for people living with cancer because a lot of times they're perceived one-dimensionally. You know, they're perceived as kind of less than fully human in some ways because they're thought of as these mere tragedies or people who you know can't have sexual desire or, or can't um, have full rich love in their lives or whatever and um, and that that distance between like the thing as it actually is and the thing as it is portrayed is is captured brilliantly in that um, in that artwork because it's a it's a picture of a pipe that says this is not a pipe and it isn't a pipe um, but of course when you look at the picture of the pipe you think that is a pipe um, because you're thinking that the representation of a thing is the thing. Um, and, and a lot of times I think when we think about people living with serious illness, we think that the, rep the popular representations of them, which I think are often very one-dimensional, often very dehumanizing, are the thing. We confuse those representations of, of, of people living with disabilities with the reality that people with, living with disabilities experience. And so that was what I was trying to hint at. Sorry, that was so... You are so smart. Yeah. Thanks, I mean, you're so... That's so... Well, I spent 10 years writing the book, so you get bored sometimes and you do, do stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, it's just amazing. While we're on the book, you have a, a really good balance in worldviews. All the characters kind of have a different approach, but none of them takes over. And that shade can weigh in on finding the balance. But how do you do it? Um... Yeah, I mean, I wanted each of them to have their own worldviews and to still love each other. Uh, a lot of times, like, we think these days life is such an echo chamber that we think you can't love somebody if you disagree with them about one thing. you got to agree about everything to, to love each other. It's ridiculous. That's not right. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, <laughs> Shay, Shay can love me despite me drinking Diet Dr. Pepper. <laughs> and you can love me despite drinking 10 cups of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, I wanted, I, I wanted, you know, Hazel, I wanted Hazel and Gus to really disagree about what the point of life is. And I love the, my favorite, one of my favorite scenes in the movie is that scene where, where you and, and Gus are, are uh, at Funky Bones and, and he's sad, and you just get mad at him. Yeah. And he's like, don't get mad. And you're like, I am mad. I, lo I love yeah. the way you say I am mad. That's one of my favorite moments in the movie because, because it's so frustrating yeah. that like, he won't see it from your perspective. But that doesn't mean you don't love him. Yeah. And that, uh, yeah, so that was just really important to me. I think that's, and I think that scene is a really important message. I mean, not that a movie should be a, 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 a message, you know. Uh, but I do think that that's a good message that, that, you don't live your life to be remembered. You you live your life, you know. Yeah. And um, I think that the, her response is really beautiful in that in that scene. Thanks, guys. Ansel, it's it's interesting to hear Ansel talk about that too. I, he's not here, but I'll speak for him. Um, because he always he always talks about like how like in this process he's learned that he doesn't like 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 last night when he was asked how he wants to be remembered, and he was like friends, family, friends and family. And that's cool to see. I don't know. It's changed for me, too. Well, I think it's not even necessarily to be remembered, but I think when one of the things I love so much about that message is I remember when I was in high school, I'll never forget when I was in high school, I was like, oh, my God, I'm going to change the world. I'm going to stop deforestation. I'm going <laughs> to do this. I'm going to, like, get yeah. everyone on the planet to recycle. And I was just, I, 
because you exist with a small community of people. You know, the, the world as you know it is re is related to, high school I went to had 3,000 people. So there's 3,000 people that I was like, this is going to be easy to change. <laughs> and then you get out of high school and you're like, wow, there's a whole world and there's millions of people who think just like me. And yet, like, you know, it's, it, there's a whole world out there and there's so many different things that no matter what you dedicate your life to, there's still A, B, C, D, E, F. And I think that that is a complex that is just, that is natural in like the coming of age process or thinking that you're the yeah. first one to ever think of an idea or the first one to ever play a song a certain way. Right. And, um, and I think that like learning at a younger age that it's, it's not about like playing that song. It's not about like it's doing it. It's playing the song because it feels good for you. It's not playing the song in pursuit of impressing others. That's why, what I think is so powerful. Yeah, that's why I feel so good about being part of this movie, especially because it's a sm it's such a small story that uh, it's just about a couple people, and it's so specific. Um, and yet, last night we hear all these people chanting these characters' names, and 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 it's it's on such a big stage, and I think that's a a really it's really amazing because it's it's um, you know we are involved in something that's going to reach a lot of people and has has the ability to you know John really has changed people's lives and and, and that was something that I even came to the uh, it even hit me harder last night than it ever has um, when this girl came on stage and she was she was crying she had cancer and she was crying about how much the book meant to her and um, you know we were all kind of giving her a hug or something that was on stage and then everybody in the whole audience started shouting her name. I was like, this is beautiful. Like, this is just, we are involved in something so much bigger than our careers and so much bigger than this movie and so much bigger than us. us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was, it was a community. It, you know what you've, like, recreated, I think, that I didn't have when I was in, when I was a teenager is a sense of community and of acceptance and of awareness. Like, there's so much the discussion on smart. bullying yeah. and what you're doing is the answer to all of those things that people complain about at that young age because you're creating acceptance and allowance for weirdness and for uniqueness and for being different. And you're creating a community that supports each other in our own quests, and that is so beautiful, John Gray. Thank you, Cher. I got a question for... We're just going to talk to each other for like... <laughs> <laughs> hey, John, you want to go get some food? <laughs> Johnny Depp once wrote that for great acting performances, you have to put a part of yourself into that performance, or it's not acting, it's lying. What part of yourselves did you put into your roles? And sub-question, what did you take from your own interpretations of the characters you play from the book? If I can start that from I, Girl's Father's perspective. Yeah, right. You can. <laughs> um, I played the, the role of Girl's Father. It was cut from the movie, but um, it was really important. It was central when I was, to, acting, he's on the when I was his acting coach, I actually told him that Johnny Depp quote. Many times. <laughs> my didn't, line was, my line was yeah. Jackie, I'm so sorry. And I just yeah. wasn't able to internalize. I wasn't able to connect to it. I wasn't yeah. able to connect. I was. I am also a father of a girl. And I was thinking, I am also a girl's father. In real life, I am I'm a, girl's, a father. girl's father. And yet I couldn't connect to that role. Yeah. And that's why it got cut from the movie. No, it got cut because they wanted to save it. They wanted to improve DVD sales because they knew people would buy them if yeah. you were on the deleted scenes. Yeah. Um... I think that I would take it even a step further and expand his quote to say, I think all of you has to, all of me has to be in a role. I'm never, I'm never playing a character or it, I am lying. You know, like I'm fully Shailene within the rules and restrictions of what Hazel's world creates. And I'm fully Shailene within the rules and restrictions of who Triss is. And, um, and yeah, I've, I'm, the greatest thing that I ever received from a director was when I was working with Alexander Payne. He got to know us so well as human beings that he came up to me one day and he's like, you're not being you, be you, be Shay. And and that was his note because I began to act and I was acting a character versus just existing as a character, as as myself through her eyes. And so I think that his quote is completely dead on. I agree. How about you, Nat? Uh, yeah, I mean, also I think that, I mean, Shay makes it sound so easy, but you have to be like a master actress like Shay to be able to do that. I mean, it's like you have to be so good to be able to be as, as simple and truthful and honest as Shay is. And that's something that... John's been saying in every article, it's like something that I learned a lot from, from working with you is that um, we're just all so in love. <laughs> we are. We are. We're, really, we're, we're are super so fond of each other. This is like our last press conference, our last day. But I mean, it really is that, that, that um, you know, I, but I do see your performances and every, 
they are different. I mean, every single one is different. So you do submit yourself to the circumstances, and so you are playing a character, but it's just coming from a truthful place. You know what I mean? Like, it's not like you're um, just uh, showing up. You know, you've done, you've incorporated the character into you, and then it comes out. You know, that's at least how it feels because every movie is so, um, is so every role you play is so specific and. But I mean, for 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 this character, for me, it was basically just I really connected to using humor to uh, to deal with to deal with pain, um, which is something that I've done my entire life. And I think, and I kind of came to the conclusion because a lot of times I thought that's a negative thing. I kind of came to the conclusion that I think it's a good thing. I mean, I think if you can you can laugh about it and, and meeting all these kids who really are going through these things. Like I met this real guy, blind guy named Ethan who helped me out a lot, and he was super angry and super funny, you know. And and so I thought that's my way into the character is um is that John? What about Girl's Father? Tell us. Like I said, I never I never got all the way there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I mean, you know, you were... you faked it till you made it though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, that idea of submitting um, completely to the circumstance was something that I was not able to do because I was like, boy, there sure are a lot of cameras in this airport. <laughs> <laughs> and they're not just on the ceiling. <laughs> um, Shaylee, in preparing for this role, you chopped off your hair in what looked very traumatic in the video. Um, I know, it does look so traumatic. It does. I was laughing when they did it, but it looks like I'm seriously crying. Like sobbing. Like sobbing. Yeah. Did you end up donating your hair to, like, Locks of Love? And uh, beyond that, what else did everybody do to prepare for their roles? And even in Especially Girl's Father. <laughs> yeah, Girl's Father. Um, I did donate it. I donated it not to Locks of Love. Children, to children. children with Hair Loss is the name of the charity. Yeah, um, and we got lots of, thousands of thousands other Thousands of other people, yeah. yeah. There was a Hair for Hazel campaign. Thousands of people donated. It was amazing. It was pretty cool. My mom did it. Yeah, that was so nice. She's mom. the one in the background of the video. They didn't say that was my mom. I was I like, they should have said that was my mom. Anyways, um, for me, preparing for the role was really because the script like was so truthful and so beautiful. I felt like there wasn't really a lot in the and the book because it's told from Hazel's point of view. Um, kind of did my homework for me as far as who she was and what her um, mental, the way that she looked at the world was uh, looked like, the way she looked at the world and how that how that seemed. Um, but physically I wanted to, I met with some people who, who had similar things as Hazel as far as breathing through oxygen tubes and whatnot. And it was mostly to, um, digest for myself how far we were going to take it in the movie. Because if I were to have authentically breathed the way that Hazel would have breathed according to the book's, um, idea... It, the movie would be very long just because she wouldn't be able to talk fast and yeah, would have to take, take like, breaks yeah, constantly lots of and, in between, between everything yeah. And, yeah and sometimes when i see the movie you know there's a few scenes where i get like riled up and angry and in, in real life if, if she wouldn't be able to do that um to the extent that we could go in the movie because she would have to take many breaks to catch her breath but visually there's like sort of always a compromise you know when you do make something into a cinematic experience so that was something that i was really particular about picking certain scenes to show that so that it still came across but not necessarily every scene so that it, there was still something um special and like the Anne Frank house when she's going up the stairs right, that really right. gets to people because you haven't seen her her in that way before which I thought was really important um and then you I mean you talked about working with Ethan the yeah I guess I yeah I guess I sort of answer. I mean I uh uh, on set, I wore blinding contacts um, for when I was supposed to be bl totally blind, and when I was supposed to just have one eye, I would wear one blinding contact, which just took my balance off. Um, and uh, it was actually easy. Like I thought it was going to be harder to to act with the blinding contacts, but I actually thought it was cool because, like, I did the eulogy scene with the blinding contacts and stuff, and it actually made me really. Um, really free like I wasn't self-conscious at all because I couldn't see the camera or the crew or anything so it wasn't so there wasn't that whole added element of like you know shaking out the rest of the world it was like I really didn't act in blinding context all, all the, time. the time yeah <laughs> that's gonna be a new thing to play every character blind yeah. <laughs> no you can play them not blind you just put them in so you don't see the cameras yeah. you just don't think the they look pretty weird <laughs> they look like you're blind <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but but um no but I think we all we all um cared about the care um we all cared about the characters and wanted to do 
do justice to them, not only to their illnesses, but also just to the characters, just without their illnesses, just to the characters. Like, we love, like, there was an interview a couple days ago um, where somebody said to John, uh, you know, how do you like writing characters with these kind of flaws? And he said, I don't find the illness flaws. You know, the, and I said, yeah, I think the characters already have flaws. Um, you know, just regular teenage flaws. <laughs> yeah, they have the flaws that people have, but like the idea that like illness or disability is a flaw is a really common trope in um, uh, in, in pop culture stories about about serious disability. Because um, if you treat that as the flaw, then the movie then the movie's going to be like, oh, the wi- the wise sick kids who you know sit in their bed and spout wisdom to the healthy kids and help them and the healthy live kids the rest learn, of their lives. learn important lessons about how to yeah right. Yeah, yeah. Whereas in this movie, it's your no healthy kids. It's actually hard. it's actually even it's funnier and it's even more painful that they're so real. You know that they're so that they are angry and funny and, yeah. and dark. And but that's why it was so happy. important to me that there aren't any healthy kids in the in the movie. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not about yeah. them. It's even fewer in the movie than there are in the book, actually. It's yeah. Less about, yeah, yeah, yeah. Less about healthy kids. Yeah. You wrote this book and you made it. Speaking as a teenager, you wrote a book and uh, the big trend right now is two teenagers. And yeah, been, that's been around for a while. Though. Yeah. Uh, um, and you didn't just write about the two teenagers who fell in love. You wrote about how they react with your family members and stuff. Yeah. What was it like for all three of y'all, you know, having that difference? Well, I mean, I wanted this to be a family story as well as a love story. Um, I wanted it to be about all kinds of love, not just romantic love. And the love between Hazel and her parents is extremely important in the book and, and I think also in the movie. Um, there's also the, the kind of off-screen love story between Hazel's parents. You know, these two, these two people who um, are going through a very difficult time in, in their marriage but are, are surviving it because of their love for each other. Um, and that was really important to me. I, and I never really wrote about adults before because I was always bored by them and I was always trying to get them out of, out of the scene as quickly as possible. Like, <laughs> let's get these kids on a road trip or let's get these kids to boarding school or whatever. Um, but I became a parent <laughs> um, in 2010 and I think that cha- I think I got really interested in being a parent. Um, and I also, I couldn't finish the book until I, until I understood, I, I, I couldn't finish the book hopefully until I understood that as long as... Um, Either Hazel or um, or her mother is alive. That relationship will endure. Uh, that that there's that wonderful uh, moment at the end of the movie where, where Hazel's mom says to Hazel, um, "Even when you die, I will always be your mom." Yeah, that gets and me. That's a very important idea because love is act literally stronger than death in that sense, and that that was very important to me. And that's not something I understood until I had a child. Do you have time for one more question? Uh, Ian Frank, uh, did you have problems getting permission to film there, or was that hard for the? It, we were the first movie ever to film there. Wow! What? Wow. They like they they like the novel. <laughs> so it's yeah. awesome. Yeah. yeah. And then her tie in with the story of one person who who did. Yeah, I mean, I think yeah. it's it, it's two people whose whose lives are are circumscribed, you know, Hazel by her her disability and obviously by by war and um and whose lives um are likely to be shorter or in Hazel's case are definitely were shorter than they should have been in in Anne's case. Um uh but also I wanted it to be I wanted them Hazel and Gus to be able to reclaim that space for life, you know. Anne Frank made out in the Anne Frank house. Well, I can't why can't Hazel? Um, you know that that like that like yeah. while you while you are here, um, you are fully alive. And uh, I thought I thought the way they did the voiceover in the movie, and then and and the whole that whole scene is just oh man, what a what a kiss. Yeah. What a kiss. I watched it like twenty five times oh. from in a non creepy way. No, 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 no. Like while y'all were filming. Over and, over again. Oh, yeah, yeah. and every time and Wick like the producer and the director would be like, I think I think they need to be a little more and I was like, That was awesome. <laughs> every and they were like, Oh we, I don't think we have a I don't maybe like a little ch- more chase and I was like, Yeah, keep doing it. Yeah, make them do it fifty times. <laughs> it was just so I it made me cry so much because it's just 
I love that the girl kisses the guy. I know. Yeah. I love it. I know. Yeah. And and I love that. I love the I love her strength in that scene. I love that she's physically weak, but she is still fully herself. Mm-hmm. I love that even even when her physical uh, limitations are really really pulling at her, she is still like you still make her fully human, yeah, wanting so all the tough. same things that any other human wants. And it's so I lo- I I'm, I was so proud of that scene. Like I honestly like that scene better in the movie than in the book. And I'm, you know, I, I wrote love that scene in the book. Oh well, let's just keep complimenting each other. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>